One of the things that you know about science is that the hallmark of science is that you uh, replicate things that either you found or other people have found. And I would like for you to know that the findings uh, with respect to the early years of development, we've now replicated in 11 separate studies, one done in Chapel Hill, and then one done as an eight site study for low birth weight babies. Uh, uh, at uh, Harvard, Yale, Penn, Einstein, a uh, host of other uh, places. Um, and the low birth weight children have now been followed out through age 18, and we see comparable findings for long-term effects from children from similar backgrounds. So. In addition to the Perry Preschool Project, the Consortium for Longitudinal Studies, uh, our work, it seems to me that the foundation of uh, support for doing something early for highly vulnerable children is well established. If you put it in the context, as public health people frequently do, where you say, do we have evidence for efficacy, meaning in small, carefully controlled trials, do we see the results and their replications? I think that the answer is a clear yes. That leads then in the next step to questions about effectiveness. Can you scale these kinds of things up? Can you put them in places where you have perhaps less uh, control? And can you get similar kinds of results? I'm going to show you some data from Louisiana to show that the answer to that is, I think, a clear yes. And then I think we're on the frontier of a new set of questions, which I hope that Louisiana will take the lead in. And I've just come from a, um, a meeting over in Lafayette uh, earlier uh, today where I believe the groundwork uh, was laid by the new uh, uh, superintendent of education for the approach to this. And it's what in economic terms and public health terms are called efficiency studies. What can we get from variations on programs that we know to be effective? When you think about this in light of where we were when, let's say, Brown versus Board of Education was passed in 1954, or when discussions began in the early 60s about what are we going to do about the poverty situation in the most powerful and richest nation on earth, I think we, we clearly see that we've come through a path that has been a productive path. And as you well know, there are programs for young children in every state in the country and almost in every county, almost, uh, you know, we have about 3,000 counties in the, in, the, in the United States, and virtually every county has multiple programs providing some form of support for young children. Um, and so the question begins to be, well, what do these cost? Can we afford them? Can we afford not to have them? We move into a set of pretty nuanced public policy uh, issues. And it is about some of that that I wish to, um, to give you some information to ponder. Let me just recap very briefly what Francis has already covered from the Abbasidarian Project. We know that that intensive program improved intelligence short term, long term. We know that it improved children's reading and math skills all the way through elementary school, junior high, high school, and beyond. We know that the kids who had the program felt as if they were more in control of their fate rather than it being just luck or someone else's uh, influence. They felt socially more competent. They spent more years in school, including going to four-year um, uh, colleges, and as you just heard, four times more likely to graduate from college. That is a graduation rate 
that is equal to the overall graduation rate in this country as a whole now, and more than four times what is uh, being experienced by uh, disadvantaged African American children. Their employment benefits, real world benefits like reduction in grade retention, special education placement, teen pregnancies, smoking and drug use, depression, and this is the kind of program that offers a twofer. It both affects the individual children who participate and there were measurable benefits for the families of the participants, particularly in terms of mothers continuing their own education and having better and higher paying employment if their children were provided. And I should just tell you in passing that the children in our control condition were not no treated children. Those children had family support social services, nutritional supplements, and pediatric care. So what you've seen from the Abbasidarian project is I think a pretty conservative estimate of what education of one variety can do on top of these other influences that we know to be important. I was presenting these results and some of the replication results um, in um, 1999 in a meeting of state school superintendents in Anchorage, Alaska. So a meeting where the 50 some odd uh, uh, state and territory superintendents come together, share ideas. And Cecil Picard was one of the superintendents present. So he heard these data and he said, you know, we have a really difficult situation in Louisiana. We're a pretty poor state overall, but we have a lot of really big inequalities. Do you think that the things you're talking about here might produce some positive benefits in Louisiana? And we talked and talked and talked and talked and we uh, helped to craft some legislation that uh, Senator Bill Jones introduced, and out of that came the LA4 program. Um, why four-year-olds? Well, no one to this day knows how much you get by starting at four versus three versus two versus one versus at birth, and there was some evidence that beginning at four could make a difference. And obviously, if a program that begins at four can make a difference, it's going to be less expensive than doing something that involves all of those preschool years. And so a variety of, 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 of thinking was, was considered, and the four-year-old program was thought to be a reasonable fit for Louisiana beginning in the year 2001. Um, that program, which many of you know, um, is uh, a beacon in the country as a whole now. It has uh, very good child-teacher ratios. It's implemented through the public schools. All the teachers have degrees. There are wraparound services that provide mental health and, and health services when needed. Um, there is a curriculum that can be described. Uh, and it was implemented in an incremental fashion. So in the legislation was passed in, in 2001, and the Department of Education and the early participants were so eager to begin that they actually implemented the program beginning in January of 2002. So the very first year of the program, which then had 13 sites, I'm sorry, 11 sites and a little over 1,300 children, is what we think of as our pilot year. And then every year since then, the program has grown. So this year, the program is in virtually every uh, parish in Louisiana, and there's a little over 15,000 students uh, participating in it. Um, the program is characterized by 
uh, high quality. How do we know that? Well, we measure the program. We take 100 classrooms uh, every year, and we choose them randomly. We go in and measure them. We actually measure more than that. And we have a consistent pattern of performance. So if you use something called the Early Childhood Environmental Rating Scale, where one is poor quality and seven is high on a variety of different subscales, the LA-4 has been running along with scores of about six. The highest publicly reported findings from any large-scale program in the country to date. Higher than Washington, higher than New York, higher than uh, Massachusetts. And every child who comes into the program receives a developmental assessment after about three weeks of introduction has gone on and every child at the end of the LA-4 academic year receives another assessment. These results show in blue the performance of the pilot group in that 2002 first half year. And then for each of the cohorts, each of four additional cohorts, and what you see across the bottom is you see the number of children who are in each of these cohorts. So 1,358 in the first year, 3,711 in the second year, 4,700. By the fifth year, we have uh, almost 7,900 children who are participating. These scores are the scores from a developmental checklist, and this is language performance. And what you see is that in the pilot year, the kids were coming in at about the 14th percentile, and they were exiting at the 31st percentile. Nice gain, not as much as one would hope, but a very substantial gain. Every year after that, the kids are coming in relatively low scoring, and they're exiting on this measure at national average. If we look at print, we see a similar pattern. In the first year, they make gains, but not as much as one would hope, but quite significant gains. In the subsequent years, they make even bigger gains. The gains are almost twice what they were in the pilot year. If we look at math, we see a similar pattern. So this program, which has high quality as assessed by independent assessors, having nothing to do with the assessment of the children or the implementation of the program, gets high marks, and it produces these consistent results. Now, here's, here's a graph that I want to dwell on for a moment. While we were working in Louisiana, we were also working in Montgomery County, Maryland. Montgomery County, Maryland is a very affluent county, the southern border of which is the northern edge of the District of Columbia, and it stretches up to about Frederick. It is a large school system with about 122,000 students in it. Historically, it is one of the most prestigious uh, school systems in terms of academic achievement of any place in the country. But the demographics have changed somewhat over the past decade, and as the inner city was regentrified, some of the older suburbs became places where inner city residents moved to, and new immigrants from out of the country moved in and settled in some of these um, more modest inner ring suburbs. As a consequence, Jerry Weiss, who had much in common with Cecil Picard as a superintendent, knew that in a place where here's the National Institutes of uh, Health, here are all these major institutions with a real educational focus, that if he was going to have the system remain, the pristine system that it was, he was going to have to do something to be sure that the kids at the bottom, the most vulnerable, didn't hold the whole place back. And so doing it both for those children and for the, the, the county as a whole 
was a, uh, a, a clear goal. Montgomery County, even though rich as a county, uh, had implemented a pre-K program under the same rationale as done here in uh, Louisiana and had put in place a remarkably similar program. Done through the public schools, same ratios, a clear curriculum that was highly similar, uh, um, uh, BA and master's level teachers in every classroom, and so on. One difference. In Montgomery County, Maryland, they put in place a full year, half day program. They did that because they had more children than they could serve with a full day, full year program. So they offered a morning program and an afternoon program. If you look at the line in blue here, this is the LA4 half year, full day program. If you look at the sort of butterscotch color um, um, graph, this is the Montgomery County Public School full year, half day program. We're beginning to ease up on being able to make some, some comments about dosage. Those two programs produced virtually the same effect. LA4, when it went to the second year of implementation, and as I've shown you in subsequent years, went all full time, produced about twice the effect. On the basis of this graph, Montgomery County put in place in an experimental program a comparison between their half day program and a full day program. Their full day program basically matches the results from Louisiana, they now, in Montgomery County, Maryland, offer a program virtually identical to LA4, full day, full year. So, if you arrive at school and don't do well, a number of things can happen to you. One is you repeat a grade, uh, one is you might go to special education, um, most of the things that will happen to you are not things we would wish would happen to our children. Uh, and part of what I I'm, why I'm showing you this graph and the next one is to say we don't have to wait as we did in the Abbasidarian project for uh, years and years to uh, find evidence for program effectiveness. One of the things I like about working in Louisiana is you have one of the best longitudinal educational tracking systems in the country. When a child enters a school in Louisiana, the child gets a unique identifier, and as long as that child remains in Louisiana, wherever that child goes, the data are collected and recorded in the central um, student information system, the so-called CIS system, here in Baton Rouge. That means it is possible to follow children and find out what happens to them as they enter. It also means we could match some children to the children who had LA4 and ask how they are doing. We can make the match at the level of whether children qualify for free and reduced lunch or not, and we can make the match not just to the state as a whole, but we can make the match down to the particular school building that children are in. So in, in the language of public health, what we have here is a kind of a case control study, if you will. Uh, this is not a randomized controlled trial, but it's a trial of individuals who were exposed to LA4 versus comparable children who did not have exposure to uh, LA4 or any other public pre-K program like Head Start or the so-called 8G program or Smart Start or whatever. And what we see here is that by third grade, there is a systematic reduction in the likelihood of being retained in grade. 
And this is true for cohort one, cohort two, cohort three, cohort four. Again, we see a remarkable similarity in, in the pattern here. The same thing is true for placement in special education, a reduction that is somewhere near a cut of nearly 50%. Given that education costs a lot more than regular education, you begin to see that these are the kinds of figures that go into the return on investment that Francis was talking about with respect to Jim Heckman's uh, findings. And then everyone in the country wants to know, well, what about the testing that takes place, the statewide testing? Does going to LA4 have any bearing on that? And we have, I'm presenting these to you because we have held off until we could get replicated findings so that we could say, is this a passing fancy? Is it here this year, gone the next year? Or do we see a consistency of findings? You know, whoops. Um, at third grade, Louisiana gives children assessments in English language arts, upper left, ELA in, in abbreviation, math, science, and social studies. Again, the red here represents the children who received LA4, and the yellow represents matched for the very same kindergarten classrooms, children who qualified for free reduced lunch, but who did not receive LA-4 or any other publicly funded pre-K program. And in the red lines, red bars, you will see a white um, line drawn through them. That white line is the state average for each of these measures each year. So the conclusion is replicated four times over at a statistical probability that is far less than one in a million. What you see is that LA4 has boosted performance in English language arts, math, science, and social studies. And in fact, these relatively poor kids who qualified for free and reduced lunch are outperforming the state average. I find that remarkable. It is, it is a bigger effect than I expected. However, it does not mean that all these children are doing great. So we are now in the business of analyzing the data to find out which of the participants didn't do as well as we would hope and what we're using to define that as children who remain within the bottom quartile, the bottom 25 percentile, on these particular measures and trying to do a set of statistical analyses to more precisely be able to identify those children with the idea to be brought to a policy forum for discussion, is there something else we should think about doing with those children who are even higher risk? Should we be considering making the program more intensive? Should we consider starting earlier, say at age three? Or is there something else that we should be doing that reasonable people could talk about and say, yeah, I think that's worth a trial? Um, and you do trials when you really don't know what the outcome's gonna be, you know? I've spent almost $200 million on my research so far, my career, and almost a billion dollars on the services to do the research. You really don't do a randomized controlled trial until you really don't know what the answer is going to be. You do lots of other things to try to get your, your base of knowledge to be as strong as it can be. Um, and what that leaves me with is what I want to leave you with is, well, we're in Louisiana, you've seen the data. 
There's not a county or a state in the country that I know of that doesn't want to do a better job of closing the achievement gap based on socioeconomic gradients and or uh, uh, racial differences. Here are three suggestions that, that I have for you. Think about each of the localities in which you might have a program because the locality is different. Calcutchew is different from um, um, some other place. Uh, East Baton Rouge is different from another place. Let's not think always in some monolithic term about what the average for the state is, but think about the quality of supports and lives in different places, and then target what you uh, want to do with pre-K pre programs based on both the local population and the resources that are available. Sort of get beyond the one size fits all. Second, I would strongly suggest that you think about creating a quality monitored and acted upon professional development and program assistance system. That is, collecting data, analyzing it, publicly displaying it, talking about what it reveals, because the numbers never speak for themselves, they must be interpreted. I believe that reasonable people, when they talk about these kinds of situations and they have options of how to respond, are likely to do the right thing that will benefit individual children, will benefit schools, will benefit communities, and will benefit the state. And as part of doing that, I would suggest that you consider measuring and publicly reporting on program quality, including uh, children's development, and following their progress into K-12 and noting what kinds of education they get in K-12 as a way of thinking systematically about an effort into which Louisiana, like every other state, already invests heavily. But I do believe no state, including Louisiana, has yet gotten to the point where it says we are doing as well as we can possibly do. There are no improvements yet uh, to be made. We're happy with where we are. So I thank you for both inviting my wonderful colleague, Francis Campbell, uh, to talk about the Abbasidarian Project and me to share with you some recent data. And I hope that together, these and your knowledge bases will lead you to have the kinds of discussions and decision-making sessions that will continue to set Louisiana apart in a positive way as a place that takes education really seriously. Thank you.